So this picture I found particularly jarring, but this is what I imagine that a postural puncture headache feels like. So what is a postural puncture headache? It's intracranial hypotension. And it happens when the leak of the CSF is greater than the amount you're producing. So you produce about a third of a milliliter per minute, and if you're leaking more than that, you'll get intracranial hypotension. So what happens? Well, we see it a lot when we, get, when we have a dural puncture with a TUI needle, and the reason it's very frequent, of course, is that that makes a big hole in your dura. Um, so 50 to 80 percent. When we make a hole with our pencil point needle, less common, about 1 percent. Um, interestingly, a lot of what we know about dural puncture and dural puncture headache comes from the neurologists, because they use larger cutting needles. And they actually have a 10, about a 10 to 30 percent headache rate. So if you think of yourself as a neurologist, it's kind of a problem because they don't know how to do blood patches. So actually, when I was at Columbia, I had a little cottage industry. I don't know that I really wanted it to be my cottage industry. But since I had a lab, and I had a lab where I could actually care for patients, the neurologists would send all their patients over to be blood patched in my lab. So it was kind of a nice study population. Um, also, in the pain world, we see um, dural leaks after trauma, after whiplash, and people with abnormalities of their collagen, like people with Ehlers-Danlos, um, can actually have spontaneous epidural leaks. And that's thought to be what underlies some postural orthostatic syndromes as well. So this is just sort of a picture of what the brain looks like in the setting of a dural leak. And you'll see that the cerebellar tonsils are sagging. You see that the optic chiasm is down lower, and the pons is flat. So those are the classic radiological signs. And so what happened um, is that the, bas basically the, the brain abhors a vacuum, right? It's a set volume that you have in there. So if you don't have as much CSF, what's going to happen is you'll get vasodilation, and it fills with blood. And that's why dural puncture headaches tend to have the physiology of a migraine, because you get that, the uh, vascular dilation, and you get migraine physiology. So how do we know? Turns out that Beer actually probably gave himself the first spinal headache when he did the first spinal. Um, he and his assistant did it to each other, and apparently they both ended up with prolonged spinal headaches. And who figured it out that it was actually the leak? In 1943, Kunkel actually proposed that it was a leak and that the meninges were sagging. Um, and then finally it was demonstrated on CT scan and MRI, what was actually happening. So how do I go back? That doesn't work. All right, well, oh, thanks. Oh, you just ask. That's how you go back. OK. Um, so again, here's an example of the vasodilation. Um, this is Doppler ultrasound of the middle cerebral artery. And you can actually measure inc increased flow in the middle cerebral artery in dural puncture headache. And that's probably why some vasoconstrictors that we'll talk about later, and Dr. Aleshi also will talk about later probably, like caffeine offers symptomatic relief. It doesn't offer any therapeutic benefit because you're not actually fixing the pathophysiology. You're not closing up the hole. But eventually the hole will close up itself. So giving people therapeutic relief you know, is useful in some settings. Um, it's very common. It happens in 1% of um, epidural blocks in obstetrics. Um, it happens in 1% of spinal anesthetics in obstetrics. And so if you figure there are two-thirds of 4 million U.S. deliveries of vaginal, then there are going to be 2.6 million deliveries. 60% of women in the U.S. on average deliver with an epidural. Um, so you've got 15,600 women every year that are going to have spinal headaches. And there really isn't anybody else that does blood patches. So you can bet that they're going to be coming to you to do the blood patches.
And you might think to yourself that, well, they really will heal, and in most cases they do heal, um, that it's a benign self-limited event. But in reality, it's not a benign self-limited event. It's not benign for the hospital at all because it increases length of stay. It definitely decreases satisfaction. One of the fellows and I just decreased, just looked at a patient satisfaction, we did a patient satisfaction survey. We asked everybody you know, how satisfied they are with their care and then we looked at factors that affected their satisfaction. Um, and second only to pain after epidural placement was pain after dural puncture. So it's really something that patients aren't happy about. And frighteningly, in a closed claims analysis, 1% of the claims were actually due to unintention, unintentional dural puncture. So that kind of surprises me because, you know, that's part of every consent discussion that I have. But nonetheless, it can be a risk for a lawsuit. Um, and it also can be associated with chronic head and back pain. And this is a study we did actually when I was back at Columbia. Um, and it was a retrospective study, but actually we've see it since um, repeated it with a prospective study that's not published yet at Stanford. Um, but we looked at patients a year out after wet tap compared to a match control of a woman who delivered on the same day with an epidural but didn't have a wet tap. And we matched for age and weight. And we found that the baseline rate of chronic headache was 5%, and in the wet tap patients, it was 28%. So that was strongly statistically significant. And we also went on to look at back pain, because actually my thought process was, well, when we blood patch these women, are we actually trading headache for back pain? And actually, it turned out that the incidence of chronic back pain was less in patients um, who had been blood patched. So giving blood patches doesn't cause chronic back pain, but in fact, the women who had had the dural punctures were more likely to have back pain than women who didn't have dural puncture. So how do you diagnose this? Um, of course, you're suspicious after a known or suspected dural puncture, but sometimes you actually aren't sure, especially if you're using fluid for your loss of resistance. You, you, know, you almost always have a drip or two out of the epidural needle. <coughs> And sometimes if you have a very small rent in the dura, you can miss it. So classical postural headache has been described um, after epidural without evidence of a dural puncture. And those probably are dural punctures that weren't noticed. Typically, patients will report a frontal to occipital headache that radiates to the neck. They can rarely have auditory or visual disturbances that actually happen because the dura is pulling on the cranial nerves. And kind of the sine qua non is that within 15 minutes, they'll have symptomatic relief. So if patients aren't sure, I'll always just say, well, lie down and see if it gets better. Um, you can also have neck stiffness, tinnitus, photophobia, and nausea. And those are all kind of migraine physiology symptoms. So if you're not really clear, you can actually get an MRI or you can get a myelogram. And this is just an example of what it looks like. So you see, um, do I have a pointer? A pointer? Pointer, OK. So you see here in the lumbar curve, this is where the epidural was. And you can see the tract here where the contrast medium is spilling out. So if you're really not sure, then you can get an MRI. And I might do that in a setting where I've actually done a blood patch or two, um, but I haven't had relief, then I would probably get an MRI. So there are actually lots of reasons to have a postpartum headache. In our prospective study, we actually asked every woman about their history of headache, and we had a surprising, I guess shouldn't have been surprised, in that women are so likely to have migraine history. Um, but there was a 39% incidence of headache in the first week in women who didn't have a wet tap. So why would you have a headache? Certainly if you're preeclamptic, you're likely to have a headache. A lot of times women haven't had a, women have coffee or tea first thing in the morning every morning and they haven't had coffee or tea yet. So actually just to be nice when I go and visit these women, I show up with a nice Starbucks latte and I offer it to them. And it might not take away their headache, but at least they'll like me better. So again, it could be migraine. And keep in mind that even someone whose migraine was well controlled during their pregnancy, it recrudesces shortly after delivery. 
And then there are some really serious things that could be. It could be a subdural hematoma. Actually happens more commonly than we think. Five in 10,000 cortical vein thromb thrombosis, or it could be sinusitis. So those are things to look at that are rare, but should just be in the back of your mind in case you see any CNS signs, in case you see any cranial nerve anomalies, any pupillary inequality, things like that. Um, so treatment, the first most important thing is reassurance. The headache is very painful. But you know, a patient who doesn't really understand the physiology, all they know is you've done something to them and now there's something wrong with their brain. So that's kind of a frightening thing. Um, and it turns out that it's actually the third most common reason for litigation after maternal death and newborn brain damage. So it is something that we want to really follow and we really want to um, treat. So most headaches, in terms of longevity, if you're using a small needle, will last more than a week. Um, but rarely they can last months to years. And so while they're really painful, they're not dangerous. Um, but I think it's important to discuss treatment with the mother right away and provide a plan of action. Because in fact, you know, unlike someone who's had a dural puncture because they've had meningitis, the new mom can't lie around in bed for a week or two waiting for this hole to heal. And she's not going to be really happy to it. So I always go and I talk to them about a blood patch. And actually, part of my consent discussion is always talking about dural puncture. And then I explain that if this were to happen to you, what we would recommend is something called an epidural blood patch, which sounds like a crazy thing. Because it does sound crazy, right? If you say to somebody, gee, you know, you had an adverse event when I did your epidural. I made a hole, so I'm going to treat it by doing another epidural. Well, that sounds like a really stupid idea, to be frank, right? So I think if you've already presented it to them, and they've had time to think about it, and you've already explained it, then it seems a lot more reasonable. Um, so whose crazy idea was it in the first place? Well, beer, you know, Mark actually gave a different reference. But at least as far as I know, beer might have given, had his first spinal headache. Um, and interestingly, it was neurologists who get a lot of these spinal headaches who observed that when they had a bloody tap, they were less likely to have a spinal headache than when it was a clean tap. And that was a very good observation. So the first report of it that I know of was Gormley. And he actually introduced it after the epidural had been introduced and became common. And he, based on the, based on the observation of the neurologist, he would inject only two or three cc's of blood into the epidural and shown that it was effective. And Di Giovanni actually started using it more in the 70s. So the technique, who here, who, is anyone here not done an epidural blood patch? One, so just a couple hands. Um, so basically it's a sterile technique. You need two providers to do it sterily. And wherever you're going to get the blood, flump, uh, blood from needs to be taken sterily. So you need a sterile prep. Um, you need a drape. Um, and the blood has to be handed sterilely from the person taking it to the person who's going to inject it into the epidural space. Now, one thing is that people will ask, should you use, um, should you use saline for loss of resistance or air? And I would say that you should do whatever you're the most comfortable with and whatever you're least likely to have another, <laughs> another wet tap with. Um, but if you are going to use saline, you don't want to inject a whole lot of it because you don't want to dilute the blood because that's going to make it less clottable. Um, and uh, often, the, per the hardest part, in my experience, is also with pain patients who come in and we actually use large volumes in pain. The hardest part is actually drawing the blood often because part of the physiology is you have sympathetic activation and the patients are typically really vasoconstricted. Um, so often, I find that, the, that that's the most difficult part. And sometimes we actually have to put in arterial lines to get blood out of these patients, particularly the long-term chronic uh, Ehlers-Danlos patients and POTS patients. So how much blood to use? Um, well, there's a classic study um, from anal anesthesia and analgesia where they randomly assigned 121 women to either receive 15, 20, or 30 mils of blood. 
Now, the devil is in the details here because the amount actually administered was not those amounts. So pretty much everybody assigned to the 15 mil group they were able to give 15 mils from. So 98% of those guys got 15 mils. The ones assigned to the 20 mil group only got 81% of them were they able to give 20 mils. And of the 30 mil group, just barely over half of them actually got 30 mils. So I'm kind of surprised they found a difference at all. Um, but basically, um, at least partial relief uh, was gotten by more people in the 20 mil group, but not the 30 mil group. And complete relief was the most in the 20 mil group. So that's how we came up with sort of the blanket recommendation of using 20 mils um, for, uh, in obstetric anesthesia. From the pain perspective, I would say that we often use much larger volumes, um, and patients tend to tolerate it better. Part of it is that sometimes we sedate them, fair enough. Um, they're also prone. We do it prone using fluoroscopy. The other thing is we inject much more slowly, and I think the thing that will allow a patient to tolerate a larger volume of epidural um, blood is actually the rate of injection. So you have to inject it relatively slowly, on the other hand, not so slowly that it clots in your syringe. So a little bit problematic. So one thing I do is I'll have the person drawing the blood actually draw it in relatively small aliquots. So I'll have them draw in a 5 or a 10 mil syringe. I'll have them hand me that syringe. I'll inject very slowly. And then I'll have them draw you know, from the same line that they put in, either venous or arterial. I'll have them draw then another 10 mils, and I'll slowly inject that. So I actually have a lot of confidence to give more than 20 mils, especially after looking and finding that that actually blood patching wasn't associated with chronic back pain. Um, and I basically give as much as the patient will tolerate. And in pain practice, commonly we give up to 50 mils. I've never done that in an obstetric patient, um, but I have lots of times in pain patients. So the other question is, when should we do it? It turns out there's actually a significant benefit to delay. So you might say to yourself, OK, so I've had a wet tap. And then I've replaced the catheter. I know it's epidural. It's behaved like it's epidural. I've done this in the patient. She's had her labor. I've let the anesthetic wear off. Why should I not then sterilely dose it through the anesthetic catheter, right? Clean up the catheter and give it. That kind of makes sense, but actually it doesn't work as well. There have been a number of studies that have shown that it actually works better after some period of time. This is actually an interesting study in that the delay was in days. Um, and it turns out that there was a benefit. Um, there was the, the percent of failure, here you see it in the black bar, went down. And it was much less by the time they got to more than five days. Now, no pregnant woman is going to wait for five days, right? She's going to have to go home. Um, but basically, the first 24 hours, um, you had there's a less chance of having success. And I kind of asked myself why that is. And I don't actually have evidence to show this, but in in vitro studies, when you mix even small amounts of local anesthetic into blood, it actually clots much less efficiently. The clot time is a lot longer. So it may be that any residual local anesthetic is actually impeding clotting of the blood. And same thing with dilution. If you use, dilute, if you use lower platelet or lower hematocrit blood, it doesn't clot as well. You don't get as much clot strength. So another question is, where should I do it? Um, and this was kind of an interesting study, certainly something we could never do in this day and age, but they did it in 1986. And they took volunteers and they injected 10 mils of blood with three to four millicuries of technetium, and then they x-rayed the patients to see where it spread. And it turns out it spreads mostly cephalad, and interestingly, as much as nine segments cephalad, so kind of a lot. So in a way, it kind of doesn't matter where you inject it, but in general, I'd say go one lower, because it spreads mostly up more than down. Efficacy. Yes, I think we have absolutely no question that epidural blood patches work, but this was a Cochrane database. This was from 2010. Interestingly, there was an update of it that was withdrawn, and I tried to get more information on that, but I couldn't find out why. Um, but here they compared therapeutic blood patch to conservative therapy for odds for continuing headache, and the, the odds ratio was uh, 0.18, so very clearly significant. 
And this was, e there was even one um, sham controlled study, I can't imagine signing up for that, where they actually did a real blood patch versus a sham blood patch in patients. Um, but the odds ratio was 0.04, so very strongly favored that blood patches do work. Um, here's prophylactic blood patch. Actually, you know, the, the designs have been kind of mixed, um, and I think that that uh, some of them waited a lot longer than others. So I think that the, you know, you might say to yourself, why not? I guess there's the question of the risk of infection. Um, but it did in many studies, actually, the lower the amount of patients that needed another blood patch, but still it was not nearly as good as doing a de novo blood patch after a day or two. So what are the risks and side effects? What do I discuss in my consent discussion with the patient? Well, I discuss pain as an injection site. And I was actually talking to one of the conference participants about you know, just epidurals in general and what you talk about to patients about epidural back pain. And the way I explain it to a patient, well, I just stuck a big needle in your back and that's going to cause a bruise. And when I touch it, I say, does this feel like a bruise? And everyone says, yeah, it feels like a bruise. So I say, all right, that's what you expect. And I expect it to go away in the amount of time that a bruise would typically go away. So if it's a lot more painful than a bruise, or it lasts longer than a bruise, then I want to know about it. But if it feels like a bruise, then it's a bruise. And most patients are pretty comfortable with that. So I tell them they're going to have pain at the injection site. It's going to feel pretty much like a bruise. Anytime I put a needle in any patient, I tell them that the, anytime I put a needle in any patient, there's a chance of bleeding or infection. It's no different than the epidural that we did in the first place. Um, there is an increased risk of dural puncture. So any patient who's had a dural puncture in the past has increased risk of a dural puncture. And I know that's problematic for you guys. It's problematic for me working with trainees. But I really do believe that the most experienced person should be on the epidural side doing the, doing the new epidural. On the other hand, I've had the experience where I'm the one who's had the wet tap, and then I have to go do the blood patch. And for whatever reason, the patient was difficult for me before, but oftentimes it's a lot easier because the patient can now bend over, they can now position, they're now not squirming around on the bed. So it's not quite as terrifying as you would think. Um, the other thing about repeated epidural blood patches is that you really do want to be very sure that you're not injecting it into the CSF because injecting blood into the CSF can actually cause cauda syndrome. So you want to be sure that you're actually in the epidural space. Um, and the other thing to warn a patient about is that they can have temporary cranial nerve issues. So they often don't realize it, but you can actually see it when you look at them, that they have slight optic, um, optic nerve changes. They have slight uh, um, ocular nerve changes is what I want to see. You can actually look at differences in their gaze, um, but patients probably won't even pick it up. They can have hyperacusis from the change in pressure, and actually sometimes you can turn their cerebral hypotension into cerebral hypertension, not dangerous cerebral hypertension because you're not putting that much in, um, but patients will tell you that now their headache comes back when they lie down. And the thing to do is just reassure them that that'll go away as the blood is resorbed and, you know, it's not dangerous. On the other hand, when you balance the risks of treatment of dural puncture headache, you have to consider the risks of not treating a dural puncture headache. And actually, when I went back to do my pain fellowship, one of the first patients I got a call from on call was someone who had had a a known dural puncture from a spinal catheter placement um, for a pain pump trial. And they called up and they had all the symptoms of a dural puncture. And I told them to go to the ER and the ER said, yes, you have a dural puncture and they sent them home. And they called me up and they said, you know, you know, call back the pain clinic in the morning. So they call, I got another call and the patient had really severe nausea and vomiting. And I said, all right, you have to go back to the ER. And I met them in the ER and the patient had a subdural hematoma. Um, so that's kind of, it's rare, but it's frightening. And particularly there have been case reports in pregnant women where they've been using uh, low molecular weight heparin postpartum. So that's just always something to keep on your differential. And the other thing is, is as I told you, we did this satisfaction survey, and it's very highly associated with patient dissatisfaction. So you have this complication, and it's really incumbent upon you to treat this complication. 
Um, in terms of contraindications, of course, patient refusal is a contraindication to any procedure. It's not, it wouldn't be a crazy thing to refuse another epidural when your last one had a painful side effect, right? So oftentimes when I present it to the patient, you know, they kind of look at me like you're a crazy woman, um, as many people do. Um, but, you know, then, you know, I kind of let them sit with the idea and I explain to them that it's treatment. I offer them conservative treatment. And I come back a few hours after conservative treatment that they don't like so much and then they're more interested in hearing about it again. Um, sometimes patients will refuse to accept autologous blood. I've had uh, patients who were Jehovah's Witnesses saying that, you know, they weren't comfortable having the blood leave their body for any period of time. Um, in that case, you know, of course, I would recommend conservative treatment, but just to keep in the back of your mind, fibrin glues are used um, in the pain world um, for patients who have these durolactasias and patients who have these chronic leaks. Um, I absolutely would not use a fibrin glue without fluoroscopy, and probably you should refer that patient to a pain management specialist, but just know that that's something else that can be done. Um, also, infection, um, that's infection in the blood, an acutely septic patient. You wouldn't want to do a blood patch in. It doesn't mean someone with well-treated endometritis, you can still do a blood patch. And of course, someone with clotting disorder, because um, there's risk of new epidural hematoma, and of course, the blood won't clot anyway. So a severe preeclamptic who hadn't resolved their platelet dysfunction, you're surely not going to do a blood patch on. And who knows what their headache's from anyway. So I'm going to very briefly touch on alternative modalities because, to be fair, I didn't realize that Dr. Aleshi is going to give a very excellent lecture after me talking about alternative modalities, so I'm going to gloss over them pretty quickly. But I think a lot of them are things that you might not have thought much about, so I'll t just touch on them briefly and I'll let Dr. Aleshi talk about them in more detail. But as I said, the problem is the hole in the dura, and the problem is the imbalance between leakage and production of spinal fluid. And there's absolutely nothing you can do to make you produce more spinal fluid. You know, people have talked about, you know, giving IV fluids and this and that. That doesn't do anything. Dehydration certainly isn't good for you, but forcing a ton of fluid on a patient doesn't help at all. So you can do things to treat the migraine physiology that's going on. And those things are caffeine, theophylline, aminophylline. Certainly of those, caffeine is the most benign. But keep in mind that you're just treating the symptom and you're just allowing a patient to tie themselves over until there's going to be healing of the problem. So if it's a patient who has a dural puncture from a small bore needle, you know, like a 25 gauge Whitaker needle, you know that that's likely to last a lot shorter than a dural puncture with a 17 gauge 2E needle. So I'd be more likely to recommend that if a patient seems to be getting better just to go on with, with uh, analgesics than if someone has a big punct dural puncture with a big needle. Um, there have also been drugs used for hypothalamic pituitary axis. This is disrupted, um, so people have used hydrocortisone. And then just pretty much anything you can use for analgesia, gabapentin, pregabalin, opioids. Um, and also acupuncture has been associated with reduced symptoms. This is actually um, in, the, in the neurology literature, so um, not so much in pregnant women. Um, these are modalities, um, Dr. Aleshi is going to talk more about this, but these are three different ways you can do a sphenopalatine ganglion block. So as a pain physician, I know it's kind of horrifying, in fact, the first time I saw it as an OB practitioner, I thought, oh my god, I'm never going to do that to a patient, but now I do it all the time. So these blocks here, we actually in the pain world do sphenopalatine ganglion blocks through the cheek. And the, we go under the zygomatic arch um, to the sphenopalatine ganglion. And the reason we do it that way is it's sterile, right? Going through the nose isn't sterile. And we're going to put steroid back there, and we're going to use radiofrequency. So that's why we do it that way. Um, but I would, of course, never do that to a pregnant woman. I would, of course, never do it without fluoroscopy. Um, but there are two other ways described. You can use pledgets, like basically large Q-tips, soaked in local anesthetic, most commonly lidocaine, and they're just placed to the back of the nose. Now, that's kind of grotesque, honestly, and if anybody walks in the room, they're going to be like, what are you doing to my patient? So there's actually kind of something that's a little bit better, and it's sort of like a squirt gun, and it's made so that the sphenopalatine ganglion is between the middle and the upper turbinate, and it's like a little squirt gun that just 
direct spec there. Um, I'm hoping Pedro will talk about it, or if not, I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. Um, other alternative modalities, and here you're just treating the symptoms, are occipital nerve blocks. Two ways to do that, the way we do it in the pain world, um, and we do this, oops, what happened? Okay, okay. And we do it with, uh, back. Okay, we do it with ultrasound, and we do it right at C2, which is where the greater occipital nerve comes out. You need ultrasound, and you need to be fairly skilled with ultrasound to do that. Kind of the old school way to do it is to do it right as, as sort of a field block all along uh, the back, right at the occipital prominence. You can feel that little sort of tip where your skull is. You can see it really well in bald men. Um, and you basically take a 25 or a 20 gauge spinal needle, bend it, and slip it from midline across the end, and as you draw back, inject local, same thing on the other side. And actually, that works really well, and I do that a lot of times for pain patients with acute migraines who come to my clinic. I'll just give them a quick occipital nerve block, and it just kind of breaks that vicious cycle of migraine, and it allows us to start using prophylactics and so on. Um, so basically, practical advice, discuss, discuss blood patch with each and every patient during your epidural consent, so it doesn't sound like such a crazy idea if you have to present it postpartum. And see all your patients after epidural. Don't let anyone fall through the cracks, because the most common risk for patient dissatisfaction and litigation is basically not following up on the complication. It's not having the complication itself. Um, and obst in obstetrical patients, where you really don't have any doubt what the etiology was, you certainly know if fluid's coming back through your TUI needle, offer them a wet patch early um, and consider therapeutic treatment and really encourage it. And really, the most important thing we learned through our satisfaction survey, and you probably know just from being experienced practitioners, is that the most important contributor to patient satisfaction is good communication regardless of the complication. So thanks very much for your attention.